recording. So Miranda is about um, the arrest. It's it's setting the, the rules for what happens at your arrest. But that's because of what happens right afterwards, obviously, where you're taken in and interrogated. So it's it's rules that are put in place at the moment of arrest, but it's actually about interrogation. Um, so if, I feel like we didn't talk explicitly about that because it, um, it's not as clear what relationship it has to compelled confessions. Um, if you're just thinking about like the, the wording that you, that you're told when you're arrested. Um, and most of you said that it was like the right thing for it to be bright, a bright line rule. Um, but we, I didn't really see very many people get into what the drawbacks. Um, hey, Peter. Hey. Um, hey, Saj. Um, I was just saying, most people said that it was, they were right to make it a bright line rule. Um, but we didn't really get into what the drawbacks of bright line rules are. So what are some of the things that can go wrong when you have a bright line rule? It's like, well, I mean, ex like exceptions are bound to happen. Like mm -hmm. everything is going to be, um, I mean, I'm sure there are going to be general trends across a lot, of, like most cases, but I think it is super, super likely for there to be one case that has one particular detail that's like you because of that detail um, would otherwise like kind of like recontextualize everything mm -hmm. and so then I guess the issue with bright line rules in general um is the fact that they don't really take those possibilities into account mm -hmm. um and in doing so uh it's like in doing so you're creating avenues um for injustice like for example like what okay what I mean by that is like um I feel like if all the exceptions happen to fall under a, like a, a particular category mm -hmm. um okay like for example um let's just say I guess the best analogy I can think of is like, for example, right now with the coronavirus, like if we reach a point in our healthcare system where it's there, they say like explicitly, okay, we can only save like 30% of the people. Mm -hmm. But, but like on top of that, like, but on top of that, it's like, let's just say the government didn't, um, didn't like have us under lockdown. Like, let's just say it's the Spanish flu, like Spanish flu. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Where the people are not under lockdown, where because of that, like the bright line rule is that, well, if you want to go to work, you go to work. If you don't want to go to work, then you don't have to go to work. Mm -hmm. um, but what that ends up um, doing is because most people who need to go to work are probably lower income. Mm -hmm. People who get sick and can't afford health care are also lower income. Mm -hmm. um, people who like, therefore are put into these high risk situations and therefore people who are going to die off are people who are low income. And so then that bright line rule becomes one where like that one nuance that was overlooked becomes like an entire, like an actual injustice because then it becomes like some form of prejudice. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And can you see that playing out with the Miranda rules? Like intuitively, I feel like I can, but I think I need to, I, I have to like think about exactly how though. Yeah. Well, do you, do you guys have a sense of um, how many people waive their Miranda rights? So they say, yes, I understand these rights of you as you have explained them to me. I still want to talk to you without a lawyer. So I'm not going to exercise my right to remain silent. I'm not going to get myself a lawyer. Um, after hearing Miranda, after being Mirandized, um, can you guess like what kind, what percentage of people waive their rights? 62. 62. <laughs> Let's get another number out there. 75%. It's 80 to 90%. Um, oh, wow. Yeah. And it does actually conform to the, um, things that you were talking about. So younger people, um, are more likely to waive their Miranda rights. Um, less educated people, poorer people, they're all more likely to waive their Miranda rights. Um, so the Bright Line rule has the benefit of being very, um, very clear for the people enacting it, right? Like the, mm -hmm. this, this gives police really clear, good guidance on what exactly they need to do. And um, it's also a benefit to them because if they do it, then anything that they do afterwards is admissible. So it's, it's like a little bit of an inoculation for them, um, like protection for them. But um, 
when it comes to how people understand it, it it's not um, it's not necessarily as clear cut. Um, people people just knowing these rights. Maybe now they do know their rights, but they aren't exercising them, um, which is of course their prerogative. But it seems like eighty to ninety percent is a little high for not exercising constitutional rights. Um, can you think of any other problems with sort of bright line rules, maybe from the implementation perspective or? Can you think back to Dressler? Cause I think he talked about that a little bit, but yeah, Isabel. Um, I don't know if this is, I was just thinking of like how in like, Missouri versus cyber, like they mm -hmm. kind of found a way like around a very like hard written, like bright, uh, a, like hardly written, like bright, bright line rule. So I feel like since it's kind of so like rigid, it's like mm -hmm. easier almost to find like a, a good way around it, if that makes any sense. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think that's yeah. true. Like, I think that's what I was thinking of that Dressler talks about when he says one of the arguments for case-by-case -case adjudication is that you can kind of have like a spirit of the law and then the judge has to go back and decide whether or not it met the spirit of the law. So it means that police are a little bit more wary about getting up to that line um, and maybe won't push it as far. Whereas if you have a bright line rule, it's a lot easier to just sort of like go exactly by the letter and not um, by the spirit. Because the spirit, obviously, of Miranda is to inform you of your rights um, and give you the opportunity to use them. Um, but there's nothing, there's nothing in Miranda that requires police to make sure. Like, they don't have to actually make sure you understood. Um, and they don't have to encourage you to exercise your rights. Things like that. Yeah, Sash. So what would be an instance where it would be preferable not to execute this bright line rule when someone's under arrest? I mean, I think a good example is with children. Um, and there's been some conversations about this because children tend to be familiar with the, um, with the sort of, you have a right to remain silent whole spiel because they've all watched television like all of us. Um, but they don't have any sense that that is imparting information that they might not have known before. And um, the, the wording of Miranda is a little, bit, it's a little bit difficult to understand. Like you have the right to remain silent. Anything you say can and will be used against you in a court of law. I'm not sure a 10 year old would totally get what that meant. Um, so they've talked about rewording some of the Miranda rights for children, saying things like, I think, I think the Seattle Police Department adopted a, a phrasing that it's like, you, it's okay if you don't want to talk to me. Um, and if you would like a lawyer, we can give you a lawyer and you don't have to pay for them. And they will be on your side and they will, um, they will give you advice on what to do. Um, which is much more sort of colloquial and easier to understand. Um, and it's sort of aimed at the idea that you want the person to understand what's going on rather than just sort of the, um, the blanket declaration that everybody has to. So it, it, like that's a, that's a situation where people have talked about it might be better to have sort of some malleability with it. Um, but it's difficult. You can't really revise a bright line rule. Um, so that's the difficulty. They still have to Mirandize them with the, with the script and then they translate it into, um, and then they translate it into sort of a more colloquial child version, like in the version that they do in Seattle. Um, but that's just voluntary. That's not, that's not something they're required to do. Um, and also I think in the Dressler reading, I think it said something to do with like abuses of power or something related to bright line rules. Mm -hmm. I don't remember exactly what the details of that were. Yeah, I think the point he was making is just that it's it's easier to abuse bright line rules than it is to 
abuse case by case adjudication because um, you could say, well, I I said I said the Miranda rules. I just said them really quietly under my breath, really fast, and um, like there are a lot of ways around it. And and as we saw with these with these um, cases this week, like it opens up a huge loophole for you to interrogate the person until they confess and then Mirandize them and then make them say it again. Um, or, or a common one was to interrogate people until they confessed and then write it down for them. So don't have them write it down, but write down their confession for them, then Mirandize them and then have them sign it. Um, so then, then you're, you have Mirandized them and you can use a written confession, um, but it's not really following the spirit of, of Miranda. Or I think, I think the majority in Miranda would say that wasn't following the spirit of Miranda. Um, if we like some bright line rules though, are, should there be other bright line rule procedures? We've, I mean, most of the procedures we've talked about are not. It's very rare that we come across one. Do you think there are others that might function better as bright line? So when we talk about the Fourth Amendment, um, mm -hmm. the, thing about, the whole thing about protection of privacy, I think there's like one case which um, the Supreme Court sort of stipulates um, anything that is within a personal, like a people's house, that is mm -hmm. like considered as private. Mm -hmm. But obviously there are like some cases about whether a porch, like a front porch, considered as part of the house or not. Yeah. But like, I don't know, but I feel like personally for Fourth Amendment, the suppression of whole evidence thing, if you're really searching into a personal, like a people's home without any... Uh, probable cause or a warrant that would pretty much be a bright line rule mm -hmm. so so like the walls of the home um, yeah 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 that is kind of what i think scalia was getting towards with some of those decisions that he wrote but everybody kept i mean as alito brought up what what does that then do with things that emanate from the house like sounds that come out of the house or smells that come out of the house or heat that comes out of the house because technically then it's not on the wall so if you're if your bright line is the wall um i don't know how how that would how we would adjudicate that um also it's kind of lay everything outside oh. would be yeah no go ahead oh no it's okay um I was gonna say it's kind of like our like our conversations about how like as technology evolves like that can also mm -hmm. bring up challenges to like bright, to like bright, bright line rules or just like case by case in general like once there's like new technology you kind of have to like reevaluate rules again. Yeah. 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 So like, like the, there might have been a bright line like the the thing with the phones was a good example of a bright line rule changing that um, it used to be that you had to sort of invade personal property to have invaded um, privacy, but phone lines go outside of the house. And so does that mean you can just tap into them on public property and listen to conversations that are emanating from house to house? Um, so then that's, that's also like a, an example of how technology can change that. So yeah, bright line rules are also less flexible as times change and things like that. Um, I think also with Miranda, I'm curious, what do you think the effect has been of it becoming so like widespread? Everybody knows this phrase. Um, even if you're not from America, you probably know this phrase from American television. Um, what do you think the effect of that has been? I don't have an answer, I'm curious. I think the least of things that should be since you might know it, that's why they don't say it. But I mean, you can never be too sure because what if they are like steaming like, you know, towards you or something? So that's why, like, in many of my responses, I feel like you just have to say it like, what if the person is like, I don't know, didn't go to high school or something and doesn't know the Miranda rights? So just 
it takes one minute, and since you've already like put the handcuffs on them, like they're not going anywhere. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yes. Not... So, so you still have to still have to say them. Um, right. But do you think it's a, it's affected the way that people hear them? You know, like if you are yeah. being arrested and you hear them. Um, I don't. Know, a couple of you chimed in. I would imagine that when someone's getting arrested, perhaps the first thing they're not, the first thing they're thinking thinking about is not listening exactly to what the officer is saying and like processing it. They're probably like panicking or something. Mm-hmm. That's a possibility or nervous in some way. It would be. So yes, it might be recited, but it may not like, it might just like, just, you know, go in one out and come out the other. But whenever they have that underlying knowledge, they... It's just like with like a language, like if you like in English, if you know the words of English in your foreign country and you hear people speaking English, you're more tuned to that and Mm -hmm. you can, and you, and it actually, it means something to you. So I think it's just, they know that otherwise, because you can't always assume that it's going to be effective in the, in a high stress setting. Mm -hmm. Um, I would disagree actually, like, um, at least from what I understood, um, I, I don't know, you were saying that, like, they would be more sensitive to the police's res- recitation of the Miranda rights just on the sole basis that they've heard it somewhere else before. Um, at least that's what I got from the foreign language analogy. I'm not really sure if I understood that right or not, but I don't think I would necessarily agree with that because I feel like it is precisely because we think that we know it so well, like, because mm-hmm. it's so popularized in pop culture that we assume we know it really well, <laughs> we assume we know what it means, when mm-hmm. in reality, like, most of us don't actually know what it means. We don't know the extent of the protections that are that we have. We also don't know um, the the areas of protection that we lack from Miranda. And so I think that having the sort of like background knowledge actually makes it so that people are more likely to not not only overlook what the police is saying because they're nervous, but overlook them on the subconscious assumption that they already know what the police are going to say, which isn't true like as like the mm-hmm. the quiz that you linked us showed like yeah. i don't know i didn't do so well so i mean <laughs> so, so yeah i think if anything like it's a bec- it's like a like a hindrance to um effective communication of i guess the miranda rights hmm. cuz it's just too I- familiar a formula yeah but i think that if someone was like purely unfamiliar that would like be the worst case scenario because they're not hearing what the officer is saying and they don't have anything of their own either. I mean, I disagree because I think if I was arrested and I had no idea what the officer was saying, I would be more inclined to pay attention to try to figure it out, right? Because like when we hear something, because it's something pertaining to me, like the officer isn't saying this to his coworker, like the officer is saying it to me. And I think in communication, just like naturally we're tuned to like pay more attention to things that we don't understand and pay more attention to things that confuse us um, and trip us up because we're trying to figure it out. And so if, for example, the officer does start saying all these things and I'm confused, like I'll probably be like, what? Like, what are you saying? Like, what are, like, what, what do you mean? And stuff like that, which would right. thing like, I guess, bring it to my attention more as opposed to like, if he's saying something like, and then I already assume I know it, that's not going to be my response. My response is just going to tune him out because I'm completely panicking. Mm-hmm. Right. So, and I totally agree that's the rational thing to do to listen. But I'm talking about like like the vast majority of people because the vast majority of people are like can easily like preyed upon and like be exploited for not knowing these things. So I think that if the, I'm talking about like like people like in rural areas or like you know people who have seen TV at some point, yeah. but like when someone's like really panicking or is extremely nervous, then mm-hmm. they may not always undergo that mental process of, I need to be doing this or I need to be doing that. But it's like, Oh my God, I need to tell my family this or that, whatever. I'm going to go to jail, whatever it is that right. yeah, they sorry. need to have like some, they, be, they need to have like some like vaccination, I guess. Like they have some idea. And the thing is that it's almost like the something is better than nothing. And of course, ideally you would try to listen to them, but realistically for like the vast majority of cases or like, when there's high stress situations, that's not going to be the primary goal. Oh, I need to be doing this. I need to be doing this. That's a very rational thought process going on, but like mm-hmm. panicking and just like feeling pure fear, I don't think would be so would really lend itself to that as much. Yeah. So the, like, the reason why I disagree with that is, be, is not because I reject your premise that 
they will be consumed by their panic. I think that regardless of whether or not you know the Miranda rights beforehand, you will be consumed by panic. But it's precisely because of that that I think that if you already assume that you know the Miranda rights, you will be even less inclined to pay attention to what the police is saying. Because now there's nothing that is confusing you. And so there's nothing that your brain is trying to work out anymore. And mm -hmm. in the panic and confusion, when you already assume that you know what the police is saying, I think that it is more likely for you to overlook it because no part of your brain is saying you need to pay attention to that. Whereas if you didn't know what it was, even in both situations, you have two people who are completely panicking because they're being arrested. They're not paying attention to what the police is saying. But I think that in the situation where you had no idea what the police was saying to begin with, then just like, just like evolutionarily, like your brain would be more inclined to pick that up because it's something new. Right. But I think that idea about being inclined to pick up something because it's new is a very like specific like voluntary process you, that you have to go through that it's not the automatic means of doing something. No, I think that's just like a psychological response. Like that's how psychologists um, like run experiments on babies by like um, by like habituating them to one like to a repetitive action and then bringing something new because subconsciously your brain will pay attention to something that's new and unseen and unrecognized. It is interesting that it's become so um that it's become such a staple of our um, public life because it's um, because it hasn't been that long that it's been around and it it has come to sort of stand for arrest but less possibly for your rights so I do think that like you do have a you do probably most sort of lay people will have a misconception about what um what Miranda is about um that doesn't necessarily mean that it's better if they're familiar if they're not familiar um I think I think it can be hard to say it would be it's not a situation where we can go back to where people aren't familiar with it unfortunately at this point so that's not that's not sort of a a thing we can go back to um but as you said from taking the quiz like it's not even if you know them, and even if you've taken this class, it's not clear exactly what you should do if you were arrested. Which, by the way, do you know what you should do? Can you sort of divine the best, the best thing to do if you're arrested? You start praying. <laughs> <laughs> what, what, sh what should be your response to the Miranda rights? If you want to put yourself in the best position. I, mean, I don't understand they... my rights. Okay, you can say I understand, yeah. Nika, were you going to say something? I don't say anything that's going to be self incriminating That's why, so please just go. And then when they, I mean, so I don't care if you feel like I'm going to like, use my Sixth Amendment and, you know, where's my lawyer and stuff like that. So. Yeah, so the, I, I would say that that is the, that's basically the procedure you should go through. You should say, um, you should clarify if it's not clear, am I under arrest? Um, and because if you're not under arrest, then you're free to go and you should go. Um, <laughs> but am I under arrest? If they say yes, then you say, I would like a lawyer and I am exercising my right to remain silent. And then don't say anything. Just keep your mouth shut. And that's, that's the best possible position you can put yourself in. Um, just FYI, I hope you never need it. Um, but that's, in, from the perspective of our system, that's the best thing you can do. I think Barad brought up an interesting point that anytime you are giving the police information, it's working against your self-interest because we have an adversarial system. So it's not, it's not just sort of from a philosophical standpoint, you're working against your self-interest. It's, we have an adversarial system and they are not on your side. So anytime you're giving them information, you're working against yourself. And if you are under arrest, you are being, you're probably being charged with something. Um, and so like any, any further information you give after the arrest is not going to be helpful to you. It might be helpful to the police. And if you are sort of magnanimous like that, you could do that, but um, it, it can only be harmful 
to you. Um, and this this kind of gets to the to the issue of like confessions in general, which which we've kind of been dancing around for a while. Like why why do you think it's written into the Constitution that you shouldn't be compelled to give evidence against yourself? Like you are you can be compelled to give evidence against other people, and you can be compelled to give all sorts of evidence, but not against yourself. Why do you think that's important? Um, well, one thing I thought about was like, if someone um, kind of gives information against themselves, so they're basically like almost handing themselves in, in a way, mm -hmm. it's like, to me, like a very like logical, like way to find that someone is guilty. Like, mm -hmm. because like they're basically saying themselves that they are guilty. So I feel like it's imp like, just because it's so, um it's like so hard to kind of like argue against that at that point like mm -hmm. like it's a good precaution to like make sure that like that happens as like that happens only when it's like actually like a willing confession because if you're if you're kind of um if, if you're going to give a confession against like someone else they can also like pick out um like like holes in your argument or like put like doubts on it but like mm -hmm. if you basically give yourself away then like no one's really there to defend you I guess except for like your lawyer or so I yeah know, that's how I thought about it yeah so like the nature of the evidence is so compelling that we should have some extra protections so that you don't you don't sort of do this to yourself right um, yeah okay yeah, I agree with that too. Like, I was, um, that was actually the question that I responded to for my forum response. Because, like, and I, I chose to respond to that because, like, it kind of tripped me up because, um, when we were, like, reading, doing the readings too, like, that was also something that crossed my mind. Like, mm -hmm. as, like, why, like, I, I, it wasn't, like, immediately that I thought of, like, a good reason or whatever. But then, like, the conclusion I came to was also very similar to Isabella's. And, um, I also feel like, furthermore, um, just, like, building off of that, and, like, I don't know if historically this is true, be, like, mm -hmm. like, historically this is how it came to be, but I know that it's, regardless, it is very applicable um, in modern day, like, right now, because, uh, because, like, just, because even we talked about, like, this um, in the past lecture and stuff like that, just, like, the uh, the nature of, like, confessions and stuff like that can be very skewed. Like, mm -hmm. honestly, I think the truth value of um, a testimony against another person versus the truth value of a confession mm -hmm oftentimes it's like not that much different like it, it can be very very different but also there are enough cases that show that you can be just as wrong about your own guilt as you can be about someone else's guilt but mm -hmm. like Isabella said the fundamental difference there is that um it is so much easier for a jury to um to believe the self-confession self-confession mm -hmm. they're so less inclined to be skeptical and doubtful towards that that mm -hmm. if you that like that like it's kind of like it's it's almost like a like it's your own death sentence really so i think maybe that's part of the reason why like this is so necessary given our like modern day knowledge about how confessions work mm -hmm. so that only like valid confessions are actually taken seriously because, mm -hmm. because there is no built-in doubt to like question that mm -hmm. so compulsion would be sort of a, a bare minimum that we don't want it that we at least don't want it to be compelled um, that doesn't necessarily guarantee that it's going to be a true confession, right? Um, people can give non-compelled false confessions, um, but possibly it's less likely that they would, that they would do that. Um, and sort of, if we step back and think about what confessions are more generally, what are some sort of, you know, everyday examples of confessions. When you when might you confess to something and to whom? Your parents, like who broke this? Or who, you know, who did this? Yeah, who broke this? Um, who broke the Wi-Fi? Um, <laughs> you know, to talk about a very important commodity right now, who broke the Wi-Fi? Um, and say you did. And so what would be the what would what would be involved in this? They were they're questioning people in the house. Um, 
what prompts you to confess? I would just not say anything. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, um, I feel like if if you knew that like they could easily find out that it was you, <laughs> okay, it might be better to just like kind of be honest beforehand so you don't I don't know, like yeah, some strategic worse later. <laughs> yeah, yeah, some strategic confessing. Like if you if you think it's gonna point to you eventually, then you might you might do that to sort of get out in front of the train a little bit. Um, and Sorry, what were you saying? Um, what's the previous question, like, based on to memorize confessions or just confessions in general? I'm thinking about confessions in general, like what, um, what prompts confessions and, and what we expect from them. Because I think our, our idea of confessions is much more lay than it is legal. Like, we're, when we think about confessions, we think about, um, I think the idea we have in our head is things like, religious confessions, and then also just the way that you confess to things to your parents, to your friends. Um, so you've, you've done something wrong, and maybe you're trying to get out in front of it, or what else can prompt confessions to your parents? Or maybe it's like in a room full of people, you know you did it, but they're actually believe maybe it's like one of your friends who have done it and they feel guilty, so you just stand up and yeah. Okay, guilt, yeah. Um, okay, so, so there are a couple of things that could prompt it. Um, none of the things were really about like you're being interrogated and coerced into it, but um, all, of this, all of these situations are situations in which you would kind of voluntarily come forward. So that's like, that's like one aspect of how we think about confessions, that they are something that you volunteer to do. Um, and maybe, maybe it's a little bit of calculation, like they're going to figure it out, so I should get ahead of this, but um, there is a sense of, of voluntariness. This is a choice or a calculation that you're making. Um, okay, so you confess. Um, who, who tells the story of what happened? Like, very basically, who is, who's telling the story of how this happened? You, because you think You, yeah. Um, but this is also another way in which it differs from most legal confessions, because usually if there's a written confession, the police have written it, and then you sign it. Um, so often there's, there's sort of an interrogation process, and you talk through it, and then they will write down their your confession and then you will sign it. Um, and so actually the story that gets told is not entirely your words. Um, it might be based off of things that you said um, and Wait, you're allowed um, to change it. I have it. a question on that. Mm -hmm. um, so like if they have it on like a tape recording or something, mm -hmm. do, does that still happen? Like do they still like write it up themselves and have you sign it or? It depends it just... on what they think is okay. more um, it depends on what they think is going to be more um, effective. So Scenes of a Crime, which is finally up on Sakai, which you guys can watch the, the documentary. Um, in that case, they didn't do a written confession. They just did his videotape confession. But there's also the fact that it's like more than 16 hours of interrogation and they only show, you know, a few minutes of it. So... Mm -hmm. You only get you only get a part of it, which is which is his own words, but it's also decontextualized. Um, so in this case, you're being heard by your parents, and you you tell them the story of what happened, whether they believe you exactly or not. Um, and then what happens afterwards? So they hear your story. People might question you to sort of some details. Okay, so you might... Consistencies. Yeah, so you're going to get some details about it. What else? How is it resolved? Fixing the Wi-Fi. <laughs> you, you, someone fixes the Wi-Fi. Maybe you have to pay for it or um, you have to arrange for it to get fixed. Um, something like that. 
And then what? What's, what's the result of this? Maybe you're grounded. And people might just, most of them will believe you actually do it because it's your own confession. Yes, definitely. So you'll, you'll be believed like this is your, people aren't going to be like, no, you didn't. Um, <laughs> so, so you you can expect to be believed and then, um, you have whatever, you have whatever thing you need to do to fix the problem. So you, maybe you get the Wi-Fi fixed and if you're still of grounding age, maybe you get grounded. Um, and then afterwards, what, what happens? I feel like people, because you confess, people are like more compelled to forgive you, mm -hmm. um, or, like not get angry, mm -hmm. um, as opposed to like you lying about it and then they found out. Yeah. Yeah. So getting in front of the train can be good. And, and then once it's over, the idea is that you go back to normal, right? Like that's, that's another reason why you confess is to sort of get it over with and go back to a normal relationship. Right. Um, with your parents or with whatever authority figure. Um, and so there is this sense of like, of forgiveness and like the, the slate gets washed clean and then you're done. Um, and so that's another sort of way in which it's different from the legal process because the, the confession is kind of the beginning of the end generally in, in like our, our lay understanding of confessions, but in the legals, system, the confession is the beginning of everything. Um, that's when you start the legal process and that's when you start sort of being tried for things. Um, and then, um, and then you have your punishment and at the, at the very end of that, um, presumably the idea is that you can return to normal society, but it's not, it's not in the same way, sort of the, it doesn't initiate forgiveness in the same way that our, our sort of general understanding of, of confession does. Um, so why, why would you confess in a legal situation? What are some reasons you would? Um, well, I mean, like you mentioned earlier, I think that some people kind of like are under the mentality of like, oh, let me just get this over with. Like, mm -hmm. and, and I think people also have the false conception that the police are on their side so it's kind of like oh well if i'm telling the truth um then like if i'm telling the truth and i'm innocent then there's no way that i'm gonna actually be like i'm just like i charge charges like not charge but um what's it called i forgot the word all of a sudden but basically like deemed as guilty um, yeah convicted yeah, you know, there, there we go. Yeah, convicted of guilty because they're like, there can't possibly be evidence that points to me because like I didn't do it. And mm -hmm. so I feel like a lot of assumptions like that would make someone more inclined to, to like, um, to maybe just confess. Mm -hmm. I think just wanting a lesser sentence. Yeah. I mean, your lawyer tells you just, yeah. you just get a lesser sentence. Yeah. Yeah, so you can, for plea bargaining, the benefits of plea bargaining for the suspect are that it's over quicker and um, that you can sometimes get a lighter sentence, although that's up to, that's sort of up to the prosecutor to, to offer. Um, and it's a little bit like choosing to, you know, choosing to buy out or choosing to roll another hand. Like, it, it's, it's a little bit of a gamble. Mm -hmm. um, when you take a when you take a plea, and there are a lot of benefits to pleading guilty when you actually didn't do it, because if you didn't do it, and you don't have the money for bail, um, and you don't have the money for a good lawyer, it's going to be way worse to have to go through the whole um, through the whole process than to just you know take six months community service or whatever there they're offering you. So there are a lot of, there are a lot of situations in which you might make a false confession um, just because it's expedient mm -hmm. and you, and you don't actually believe it at all. Um, so, so when we're talking about false confessions this next week, it's the ones we're going to be talking about are actually situations in which police, people came to believe that they did it. Um, 
and actually started to think that maybe they had actually done what um, what they confessed to, but there are also a lot of situations in which you might just falsely confess knowing you didn't do it because it's expedient um, and it's the better choice for you. Um, so so that, that means that false confessions are m more common than we think of them, right? They don't have to be the situation where you where you get tricked into thinking that you did something you didn't do. Right. Um, why do you think we value confessions so highly as proof? If we know, you know, one of the one of the real difficulties that like will be talked about in the um, in the documentaries is just that you cannot, for the life of you, convince juries that someone will make a false confession. Like you just, you just cannot convince people that that happens. Um, why do you think that is? Well, I know for the prosecution, it makes the process so much easier to just say, give you the confession. You know, it's just the assumption that they did the crime uh, is enacted. And Yeah, that's what I have. Yeah, that that it makes it so much easier on the on the prosecution when you confess. Right. Yeah. Um, I think this has to do with like, I guess the other side of this, um, of like this course, which is the impact that media and literature has had on um our legal system through the jury and things like that. Mm -hmm. and that part of it is also because like all for example like every like true crime show or um a lot of like a lot of like detective stories they all follow the storyline where the ultimate goal of the detective or the ultimate goal of like the police officer is to um get a confession so the confession becomes like an end as opposed to just like another piece of evidence that points to this person's guilt and so then i think if that's the case then and that is like very much the dominating assumption in like popular culture and in the minds of the general public, then I think that it is very easy for a jury to see a confession as an end. And so once you reach a confession, then there's nothing more to do. Like there's nothing more to question. There's nothing more to doubt because like that is like the ultimate goal. And also it also doesn't help that in um, these forms of media, the like the way that the story is told and the way that it's portrayed is that once someone confesses and they absolutely like they absolutely certainly um, like committed the crime, and so that, I think mm -hmm. that all feeds into that feeds into the um, into like the narrative as well. And so then I think like after a lifetime of being, I guess, exposed to that, and then never challenged to question it, it's hard for then a jury to like um, reconsider that. And also, it's like self sabotage, and it's like very counterintuitive mm -hmm. to believe that someone. Why would you do that? that? Yeah. yeah, like that's not like it's not something people normally do. Yeah, except that we self-sabotage all the time. Like, we just go around self-sabotaging ourselves all the time. Like, we don't we don't talk about it that way, but we're constantly doing that. Like, we procrastinate and we, you know, we do things that are bad for us all the time. We eat things that are bad for us. We, you know, we make bad choices. We, but we have this narrative about ourselves that we wouldn't, you know, we wouldn't do anything like that. We wouldn't do something that was bad. Right. It's bad for us. Um, yeah, that's enough. speaking of narratives and speaking of like ideas that, that won't die. Um, <laughs> this idea that we we won't work against our own self interest is, is kind of a bizarre one. Mm -hmm. um, says a procrastinator, like I <laughs> I constantly do things against my own interest. Um, <laughs> but the I think you make a good point that like the detective, even when we're watching like police procedurals, which are sensibly about the law, the version of confession that we get is much more like, like the lay idea of confession that, you know, once you confess, that's the end point and it's over and you're done and we've solved the problem and that's it. Um, Sasha, did you have your hand up? No, I did not. Okay. Um, yeah, so it's something to think about when you're 
when you're watching these. Like, I think, I think it, it's something to think about, like, would you, can you imagine a situation in which you would make a false confession? Um, what are the parameters that would lead you to a, a false confession? And um, also sort of secondarily to think about what the legal system can do about that. There are some things that other legal systems do, like you're, there are some where you, can't have an uncorroborated confession. You can't admit an uncorroborated confession. So there has to be some other evidence pointing to you having done it. You can't just have the the confession without any sort of other corroborating evidence, um, which is supposed to, I think, be a little bit of protection against false confessions. Um, but there are other measures too that you could take um, in that case. So, any other questions about Miranda or Missouri or Oregon? It just occurred to me like a few minutes ago, like, um, so you mentioned 80 to 90% of people who will just during the interrogation will waive their Miranda rights and actually start talking. And I feel mm -hmm. like one of the reasons for that, one of the major reasons might be that people actually believe they remain silent and that silence can be used to against them in the court. Mm -hmm. Like for normal people, especially if they haven't really done it, they were like, okay, so I, I'm not really the suspect. So uh, I'm not really the culprit. So why am I hiding this stuff? Like whatever, whatever telling, they're eventually going to find the truth. So I might, might as well just tell them. Yeah. That could, I don't know, somehow get into trouble. Like for me, if I were to really be like under investigation, under interrogation, and I haven't really done it, I like for a very high possibility I would just talk instead of like sit there waiting for a lawyer to help me do the talking. Yeah. And why do you think that is? Why do you think you would feel like compelled to talk? Because I, I don't know, like, so first of all, in like police interrogation setting, that might be, you, you definitely feel intimidating and a little bit coercive, like naturally. And like for me, I would just feel compelled to talk in a sense. Mm -hmm. Especially like, I definitely heard about this whole Miranda thing in the TV shows before, but I think in the whole Miranda thing, they didn't really mention that your silence cannot be used against you. Mm -hmm. So they don't that. yeah, so like that would be a major concern for me. Like, what if, like, if I'm actually going to the trial in the future days, and the police mention that guy remains silent during one of the questions we ask, so he might be suspicious of doing that. Like, that would be a reasonable assumption for me in thinking of mm -hmm. that. So. Yeah. yeah. And again, that I think that's going off of this, how you would confess to your parents or something like that. Like if you, if you didn't give the details and you, you were holding something back, it'd be like, well, why aren't you, they'd no. naturally think you were hiding something because exactly. that's, that's sort of the, the way that we think about silence during confessions. Um, whereas in, in our adversarial system, it was very counterintuitively, you do have the right to to just not say anything. Um, but I think it would be very difficult to stay silent um, if you're being interrogated. Yeah, I I think the same way that Peter does. Like, I feel like if I, it's almost like if you're, if you don't, if you know yourself that you, you did nothing wrong, then like, what could you say, I guess, that like goes against you? But yeah, in like, in a more like legal sense, it's still, it's still bad to say, I guess, anything at all. Yeah. 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 Well, there's so, there are so many technicalities and there are so many laws that, um, I think the problem with the interrogation room is that it looks a lot like other kinds of conversations, right? It looks like you're having a conversation with just another authority figure with your parent or with a teacher or with, um, a principal, something like that. You're having it looks a lot like other conversations that you've had in which you've been able to sort of intuit your way through it, right? Like negotiate with them a little bit and say, well, I, I didn't do it. So here's everything that I know. And that will prove that I didn't do it. Um, because in most of those situations, that would be a good thing to do. That would be in your favor. Um, but you can't intuit your way through a police interrogation. Um, that's folly. <laughs> you, you need a lawyer to tell you 
what what things you can and can't say. Even if you want to confess, you should have a lawyer because they can tell you exactly how to confess um, and how to get a better deal for your confession and things like that. So um, I think the interrogation room is very misleading because it feels like feels like any other kind of conversation or confession, but it's not. Um, that's not something anybody could navigate on their own. Lawyers will get their own lawyers if they're being interrogated because you can't do it yourself. Um, but yeah, it's very, it's very misleading because obviously you would think, no, I should tell them everything if I didn't do it because then they'll believe me. Um, Is there like any famous precedent uh, in history where like one people confess, but later the jury or the court found some evidence that is like pointed against that self confession and they actually in the end overturned that guy's confession to yes. cases like that. So one, so both of the things that we'll be watching these coming weeks are like that. Um, oh, okay, cool. One of them, one of them is a case of a father who is, who confesses to killing his four month old. Um, and through, through sort of blunt trauma, like throwing him against the crib. Um, and it turns out that the child didn't actually die of that. The child died of an infection, um, but he confessed to it. And so he was convicted and it was later overturned because of the medical evidence that he didn't, that that isn't actually how the child died. Um, and then the other one is a famous set of confessions by I think Navy men. Um, I think four different men confessed to rape um, and none of them had done it. Um, and they found the person who did it later through DNA evidence. And so they were all, they were all exonerated, um, but they all confessed. They all independently confessed to it. So yeah. Got it. Yeah, not to give it away, but it, it, that's sort of upfront from the beginning that they're false confessions. Okay, um, I'll look forward to that. Yeah, and the, the scenes of a crime one is, is, I think, interesting because you can see the whole interrogation. So you can kind of watch as it, as it develops. Um, the other one is a little bit more of a bird's eye view of how the interrogations took place with the, with the rape accusations. Okay. Um, any last questions? We're right about at time. It's really good to see you guys. Yeah, so oh, yeah, I actually did have like a more like yes. logistical question. Um, I posted this on like Sakai, but mm -hmm. um, so do you know how like the peer conference stuff for next week is going, going to work? Yeah, yeah, it's a good question. Um, I, I wrote back just this morning and said, oh, I will, figure, no, it's okay. I, I need to figure that out. Um, but actually that's a good question to put to you guys. What do you think is the easiest way to do this? I wanted to put you into groups of, of three. So you have two partners and you give them your draft and you guys read it over and give each other feedback. I don't have a preference for if you do it in real time or on a shared Google doc or however, however is most convenient for you. That's fine. Um, how would you like to find your partners? Should I just assign them or? Yeah, I yeah guess. random assignment would be good. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay, good. I will just assign them. And I'll try to go by time zones that I know, but um, at least for people who are out of the US, I'll try to sort of put them together so they can be on the same schedule. Okay, sounds good. Yeah, thank you. Thank yeah, you. No problem. You guys are all in sort of Eastern or Central, right? Yeah, I'm Eastern. Eastern, yeah, Eastern. Mm -hmm. Okay. Sounds good. Yeah. Okay. Okay, thank you so much. Yeah, thank take you. care, Bye. you guys. Thank you. Bye. See you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.